My name is Susanna Sarksen, and I'm going to talk about nonlinear model reduction for dynamical systems using sparse sensor locations from learned libraries. This is a joint work with my advisor, Nathan Kutz, from the Department of Applied Mathematics, and with Stephen Brunton with, from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Washington. I'll start with the motivation of the work. I'll uh, introduce uh, reduced order models, discrete empirical interpolation method, and sparse sensing. And then I'll talk about our goals and ideas, and we'll test them on a model problem. Uh, as many of you know, lots of phenomena in nature can be um, described using nonlinear partial differential equations. For example, water waves, tornadoes, lasers. And usually those nonlinear partial differential equations are impossible to solve analytically, and people try to use, solve them numerically. Uh, in order to do that, they discretize the partial differential equation and get a system of ordinary differential equations. However, in order to achieve a good accuracy, the dimension of the ordina ordinary differential equations, the, the system, is pretty large. Uh, therefore, people use other methods to make this simpler. One of the methods we, we're going to talk about is proper orthogonal decomposition, which reduces the system and uh, to a reduced order model. Okay, suppose we have a system of uh, ordinary differential equations where L represents the linear part of the system and N is the nonlinear part. As was mentioned, the dimensionality of the system is assumed to be large. Um, however, fortunately, lots of uh, dynamics of interest exhibit low dimensional structure, which means we can approximate that high dimensional uh, system with a smaller dimensional system. One of the techniques to do this is called the proper orthogonal decomposition method. How this works? We collect measurements during time and then we stack them into a big matrix. Then we take a singular value decomposition of the matrix. As well known, the best basis for approximating U then uh, given by columns of matrix phi. And um, in order to get a good accuracy, we don't have to uh, choose lots of times. We don't have to choose all the columns of phi. Instead, we can uh, choose some criteria and pick some number of k uh, that we're going to use. OK, using some criteria, we pick k. And in practice, this k is much smaller than n. And in that case, our solution u can be represented as a linear combination of the modes uh, of the columns of the matrix phi. Uh, or if we can write that uh, linear approximation as matrix times a, where a is the coefficient factor, and we aim to solve for a. So, of course, if we have A, we can reconstruct our solution U. We will refer to this, uh, to this vectors phi1, phi k as uh, either POD modes or linear library modes. All right. So we have our approximation. We have a system of differential equations to solve. We'll simply plug in this approximation into the system, and then we'll get a system of ordinary differential equations for A. Remember that uh, A is k-dimensional, and k is much smaller than n. Solving this equation, this system for A, we can recover our solution U from this formula. So instead of solving this large n-dimensional system, we can solve this k-dimensional system and recover a, uh, U. However, this method has its own drawbacks. Uh, let's consider a very simple case. When we have nonlinear, when the nonlinearity is simply u cube, and we have only two mode expansion, then in order to compute u cubed, we have to compute all those inner products. And remember that each of these phi uh, vectors is n dimensional, large dimensional. So computing all those inner products is expensive. Now, what could we do to make this easier? Um, discrete empirical interpolation method suggests to approximate nonlinear term instead of evaluating it. How this is done? First, uh, we construct a basis to approximate nonlinearity. And uh, we, we do that by uh, first constructing snapshot matrix for nonlinearity, then taking its singular value decomposition. 
as was discussed, the columns of psi give a uh, best in an alto sense approximating basis for uh, function n. We'll call uh, the columns of psi as a nonlinear library mode. Usually, um, which was again some cutoff criteria to pick the number of columns we're going to um, pick. And in practice, again, that number is much smaller than the dimensionality of the function. Um, OK, if we have our basis, then we can write the approximation in the following way. And if we solve for c, uh, if we find c, we can recover our nonlinearity. Now, this is an overdetermined system. And one way to solve it is to select m rows from the system. Solve for C T uniquely from that system, and then plug in back to find N. So how the selection is done? Let's look at the picture in the corner. For example, if we want to select third red component from vector N, we can simply multiply it with a vector that has all zeros except the third location where it has one. So basically, selecting some components from vector corresponds to multiplying it with matrix P transpose, where the columns of P uh, consist of uh, the columns of identity matrix. OK, so we want to select M rows from the previous system of equations, which means we're going to multiply both sides of this equation from, uh, with P transpose. Then if we're uh, lucky enough so that this matrix in is invertible, then we can solve for CT from here and then go back uh, and plug in that for the approximation of nonlinearity. So note that in this case, we get N is approximately equal to some pre-computed matrix B, which is this part, uh, times P transpose N, which is nonlinearity only at some components. Now, the question is how to choose this indices so that this matrix become invertible and we can solve for CT uniquely. Uh, Chaturantabut and Sorensen proposed an algorithm, discrete empirical interpolation method, to do this. Uh, we're going to explain them using um, this picture. So suppose we have our nonlinear library modes and we want to select uh, gamma 1, gamma j. First step will be to pick the first column of matrix, uh, matrix psi 1 and then find the m index of the maximum of that matrix. You see that red? So we pick psi 1, we pick the maximum uh, index, and then uh, we take that as gamma 1. Then we solve this equation for C we compute the residual, and then we select, as a second index, we select the maximum of the uh, index of the residual. So now we have two indices selected. Then we go back to this equation. We calculate, uh, we solve for C. We compute the residual, and then we again find the maximum location of the residual, and that will be our third location, and so on. OK, so what we did so far, we had this large dimensional system. We reduced it to a smaller dimensional system. Then we approximated nonlinearity. And can we do something to make it even more simple? Yes, if we use sparse sensing techniques. So how does this work? Uh, usually, it's impractical to take full measurement. Instead, uh, it's possible to measure solution only at some locations. So we'll call that um, small measurement as u hat. Uh, if we have u hat, then and we know the location of the measurements, then u hat can be represented as p transpose times u, where p is the location matrix. In that case, if we have the approximation of our solution ut from the proper orthogonal decomposition, we can plug in uh, that expression into here. And then we can solve for a from this equation and recover uh, u. Uh, however, 
we need to select locations for this measurement so that this, uh, this vector A can be sparse and also can give us a good recon reconstruction. Okay, let's talk about our work. work. We considered um, nonlinear dynamical systems that have parameters, and those parameters w uh, can change during the time. By that I mean at some time interval they take specific value, then in another time interval they can switch their values to something else. Our goal is to collect sparse measurements, to classify those measurements, which means find the parameter regime that this measurement is in, then reconstruct full solution, and then predict the future behavior. And our main ideas in this paper were to collect measurements uh, at the locations given by Dimes algorithm and also use nonlinear library mode for classification purposes. Okay, let's test it on a model problem. Let's consider a complex Ginsburg-Landau equation with cubic and quintic terms. Uh, this equation is uh, important in physics uh, since, it's described, uh, this, since it de describes superfluidity, uh, nonlinear waves, uh, lasers, and so on. So this equation has lots of parameters and we'll refer to that parameter set as beta. We'll consider six different parameter regimes, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 6. And the solution for three of them, you can see in this plot. Um, we'll consider the case when uh, in this time interval from 0 to 100, the parameter values uh, are from beta 1 regime, then they switch to beta 3 regime, then to beta 5 regime. The solution is pictured in the corner. Uh, recall that we're trying to collect sparse measurements. We're trying to classify them, which means find the parameter regime that this measurement is in. Then we try to reconstruct the full solution and then predict the future behavior. Okay, so from this equation, you see that there are uh, two nonlinear terms, cubic term and quintic term. Um, and each of these terms multiplied with a parameter. So we decided to split this nonlinearity into two parts and then construct the basis uh, for them separately. That's why we built nonlinear snapshot matrix for cubic term, quintic term. Then we applied the singular value decomposition to get the nonlinear library mode. This is the cubic library mode, this is quintic library mode you see that they are very similar to each other for each regime. However, uh, library modes for quintic terms are stiffer than those for the cubic term. Okay, since Dimes algorithm uh, is not uh, designed for parameter uh, for, to have parameter values in the equations, there are various ways you can um, apply this algorithm to our equation. One way will be to take only cubic term and only one regime and then apply Dimes algorithm to that regime. Or uh, you could stack all three regimes together and then apply uh, Dimes algorithm to that matrix, which will be the fourth column of the uh, table. You could do the same with cubic term, uh, with quintic term, and with nonlinear terms combined. If we have uh, enough resources so we can uh, put sensors in all the locations, then we can simply choose each of these locations and then put a sensor there. However, if we have only limited number of sensors, um, we have to use some criteria to put them. So we su suggested to build the histogram of the locations and then put sensors at those locations that have big spikes. For example, in this picture, you see that we have many sensors at location 0, 6, and 13. So we're going to collect sparse measurements at these three locations. You see that these locations on a library mode Psi13 correspond basically to minimum and maximum of the mode. All right, so we collect measurement at these three locations, and the next task was to classify this measurement 
which means find the parameter regime that this measurement is in. So here is our result for cubic uh, library classification and quintic library classification. Each regime has its own color. So here we selected um, a measurement from beta 1 regime, and you see that it's classified correctly. Uh, in second row, uh, we selected a measurement from beta 3 regime, and again it was uh, classified correctly. And here we have beta 1 regime. So those locations give a good classification. Now we should do reconstruction. And if you'll see the true solution and the reconstruction, they look pretty good, except the magnitude are a bit different. You can see from the colors. And also the tails of the solutions are a bit different. But overall, it did a pretty good result. All right. Uh, in practice, it's usually impossible to take clean measurements. Measurements are usually have a Gaussian noise in it. So we'll assume we have noisy measurement U tilde, and then we'll do a classification with cubic and quintic nonlinear library modes to achieve an ac a good accuracy. You see here that mostly the regimes were classified correctly. And uh, it's worth mentioning that nonlinear library modes uh, do classification much better than if you choose a linear library mode. Okay, sometimes uh, it's, po it's not possible to measure uh, linear solution. Instead, we measure nonlinearity. So nonlinearity has a noise, non measurement for the nonlinearity has a noise in it. Then if we use uh, cubic and quintic nonlinear li non library mode for classification, we did pretty much a 100% accurate, accurate re uh, result classification. This was it. Here are some references. This is my paper. Uh, here is a link to my paper. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at ssusie at udap.edu. Thank you very much.